For those who don't know me, I'm Stephen Kitt. I work for uh, Red Hat and I'm <coughs> active all over Open Daylight, pretty much. <laughs> but mainly in ODL Parent and OVSTV. And so we're going to talk about semantic versioning. Um, I'm going to start by saying what it is rather than why we're talking about it, and then we'll go into the why and how it, if it's useful for open daylight and what we should do about it. So it's, the first part is me explaining the semantic versioning spec, and then I'm hoping we can have more of a discussion afterwards. So semantic versioning is uh, a concept, uh, basically, that means associating uh, meaning with version numbers of software packages, whatever. Uh, and there's a spec on semver.org. And so the 11 next slides, they're just a retranscription pretty much of that spec. Um, most people agree that it's, uh, that spec is a sensible definition of semantic versioning, but lots of people then don't necessarily read all 11 points carefully, uh, and it can end up being misused. But that won't happen on open daylight, will it? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first point of the semantic versioning spec, and the most important one, is that it only interests itself with public APIs. And it's up to you to define what a public API is. You can say it's anything that's in my developer's guide PDF, or you could say it's anything that's, that has vague Javadoc, or it's anything that's public. In, Java terms and not API terms. So that's something that we need to agree upon, I guess. Uh, and then anything that's not in the public API that you've defined is not covered by the semantic versioning spec. So that means that even classes that are public or public methods that are accessible uh, in Java, if they're not part of your public API, all the guarantees that come with semantic versioning don't apply. So there's still a certain amount of freedom. And it means that uh, you do need to document your stuff because your users are going to have to rely on coding using documentation rather than coding using implementation, which I think is nice. But we're not quite there yet in Open Daylight. The second uh, point is that so semantic versioning defines a canonical version layout, which isn't too surprising compared to what we're used to with version numbers. So there's three components, x, y, and z. X is the major version, Y is the minor version, and Z is the patch version. And then the rest of semantic versioning defines rules about how you change those different components. Uh, all of those three components are always non-negative integers, starting with zero, but they can't have leading zeros. So 01.2.0 is an invalid version number. And but zero dot, zero dot something is fine. It's nice because it avoids uh, octal surprises. <laughs> um, the third part, third point, and this, one, this is one that sometimes gets forgotten, is that once an artifact is released with a version number, it never, ever changes. So you get some projects which ignore that, and they'll realize that there's a nasty bug in something that they've just released, and they'll silently update the tarball or move the tag as we were discussing about OpenStack just uh, a few minutes ago. Well, that's not quite the same context there, but if, if you do this, bad things happen. So it, basically, once you've defined what your release artifacts are and you've released something with a given version, we can take a hash of that and it should never, ever change, ever. Um, point four. And this, this uh, relates to what Andrew was asking about version zero. So version zero does exist, but there are no guarantees as far as semantic versioning is concerned. It doesn't apply until version one. So that's nice. It means that when you're starting something, you have no idea really what you're going to, what would make sense as a public API and so on. So you use version zero, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and so on. As long as you don't start, as long as you don't have version one or greater in the first component of the version, there are no guarantees. 
Part five is, so as a consequence of that, version 1.0.0 defines your first public API. And it's, if you're starting, off, starting a new project, it's fairly important to wait to get that reasonably right because it's, once you've started that, it's going to constrain things uh, in the for the future. So one thing that isn't covered uh, in these points, but I think it's worth pointing out, is that uh, we're not in JVM land here. Oh, well, um, or should I say rather Java JDK land here. So you are allowed to remove things. It's not because you've defined something in a public API that you're stuck with supporting it for the rest of your life. But it is important, it is important to make at least a reasonable effort to get version 1.0.0 right. Right, so then what are the rules for incrementing all these different uh, components? We'll start with the last one, which is the patch version. So if you make a new release of a piece of software, an artifact uh, that has only bug fixes that are all backwards compatible, then you only increment the last uh, part of the version number. So you go from 1.0.0 to 1.0.1. And it says here a bug fix is an internal change fixing incorrect behavior. And so this is incorrect behavior as defined by the public API. So if you have, if you, if there's a bug in your code that means that it doesn't match the documented behavior, that's a bug and you can fix it with a minor, with a patch increment, even if it breaks stuff, because people shouldn't have been coding to your implementation, they should have been coding to your documented public API. So that's, that would be a big change for Open Daylight as it stands currently, but I think it would be quite good to have. So the next, next step up is uh, when you're adding new features, but uh, in a backwards compatible way, or if you're uh, deprecating existing functionality and you release a new artifact, then you increment Y. Um, you can if you want, but you don't have to increment it if you're adding new functionality to private code. So that's stuff that isn't part of your public API. Um, but just to, just to show people that um, code is moving, because there is, you know, despite what the semantic versioning spec says, you end up with certain expectations. If you go from 1.0.0 to 1.0.1, people will expect that there are only so many lines of code that have changed. And if you've, if you're, if you've been fixing bugs and at the same time preparing a huge change, and so you, there's a couple of patches in there that have 5,000 lines of code added, and you go from 1.0.0 to 1.0.1, some people might be surprised. So it would be legal in this, according to the semantic versioning spec, but if you want, you can do 1.1.0. Um, obviously, if you're releasing a new minor version, you can include bug fixes, that's fine. And when you increment Y, you reset Z to zero. So you'd never go from 1.0.1 to 1.1.1. You'd go from 1.0.1 to 1.1.0. If that makes sense. And then the last component, the first one, major versions, is that you change that, you increment it if you introduce backwards incompatible changes to the API. Um, and of course, while you're doing that, you can still introduce bug fixes and uh, new features that are backwards compatible, and you reset Y and Z to zero. So the expectation is there that if you go from 1.0.0 to 2.0.0, or 1. anything anything to 2.0.0, your users know that they're likely to have some work to do before they can switch to 2, because there's probably stuff that's disappeared, so de deprecated APIs that you've actually removed in version 2, or some changes you've made uh, require changes to the code that's using um, your artifact. Then point nine, <coughs> pre-release versions. So now we're going to get into more sort of uh, kind of details that you don't necessarily need to know all the time, but it's good to have it in, in mind. We have the three components, x dot y dot z, and you can add extra stuff afterwards. And this defines, the next two slides define how that's interpreted. So if you start with a dash and then uh, alphanumeric characters, that's pre-release versions. So you can imagine that as a, 
in, it would be like a graph and you're trending towards your, t your version uh, asymptotically. So 1.0.0 dash alpha, that's an alpha release of 1.0.0. So it's not quite 1.0.0, but it's getting towards it. And so that means that 1.0.0 dash alpha uh, sorts less than 1.0.0. So if you release an artifact and you call it dash alpha, then when you remove the dash alpha, uh, your new version, your new release artifact will be considered as newer than your alpha release, which is nice to have. Yeah. So basically, the uh, GA suffix or service releases, service packs are not um, according to the standard. Not according to the semantic versioning standard. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so Maven doesn't quite do semantic versioning. You know, when you see like Nete 4.0.33. Final, that's not a semantic version. Okay. It's because so the four. Is the yeah, the G is without the dash. Uh, yep, and so you can the 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 uh, pre-release versions are sorted alphabetically, which works out well for alpha, beta, and gamma release candidates. But if you get that wrong, you can have end up surprises. But you can always add extra stuff afterwards, and that sorts <laughs> later. So alpha comes before alpha dot one. So it's ASCII-betical? Yeah, it's ASCII-betical. Okay. So one comes before alpha. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also add build metadata. So instead of starting with a dash, you start with a plus. And that sorts after the version you specified. So 1.0.0 dash alpha plus uh, GD7BB7C. So that's, a, that's the Git version description that you get, that Git will give you if you ask it nicely. That sorts after 1.0.0 dash alpha. Uh, and so there are typically two ways of doing this. Um, uh, well, actually, no. One sensible one, which is to use dates, as in the second example there, because they sort nicely. Uh, Git hashes don't, so that's a bad idea. The plus G one thing, G thing there. But it's nice. It's, sometimes it can be nice to have the Git hash just to find things because people don't know tags. But. And the last one is precedence rules. Um, so that they're. This should be reasonably obvious given what I've said so far. Uh, if you're, you're, you want to compare two version numbers according to the semantic version spec, the way you do that is that you take the uh, th first three parts, split them up, major, minor, patch. Uh, they might have pre-release stuff, they might have build stuff. Uh, the first different element uh, determines the precedence. And you compare the, first, the major, minor, patch uh, components numerically, always. Pre-release, it might be numeric. If so, you compare it numerically. Otherwise, it's uh, ascobetically. Uh, numeric elements are always lower than non-numeric. And uh, so null pre-release identifiers are lower than non-null. That's just a complicated way of saying that if you add extra pre-release components, they sort, after, they sort later. So you could uh, call your versions 1.0.0 dash alpha and then 1.0.0 dash alpha dash beta if you really wanted and that would sort after uh, dash alpha and actually the stuff I was saying about git, git tags being bad for builds is rubbish because the build part doesn't is never taken into account for precedence rules so it doesn't matter Yeah, if you have 1.0.0 .0 .0 plus 1 and 1.0.0 plus 2, they're considered as equivalent. I don't know what happens. Yeah. It's, undefined, it's undefined in the spec, That's undefined behavior. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, idea is, the idea is you don't, you never use build stuff on its own. You make sure that your version is, well, yeah, you bump your version or add extra pre-release information. And <coughs> the build stuff is just a way of adding information <coughs> So that you can find things later. But what I, what but, uh, I don't want to use build information in open daylight in the short run. Yeah. Um, and so, what is the place to put the identifier? 
exists? Oh, uh, pre-release, um, yeah, so you can say um, so dash one, one, you can have 1.0.0-1.0 .0 .0 .0 if you want. And, and, and how is that done in precedence? Like, how is it tokenized? Or is that a read It's tokenized using dots. So dots separate components in, okay. uh, uh, in the pre-release version, as well as okay. the and major then ones. Then, and, then and then after that, it's alphabetically. So anything, so you're allowed, um, so I, I, I allowed it some information there. So it starts with a dash, and then inside it, you're allowed to have any Number. alphanumeric character and dot. dash and dot, and dot separates elements. Yes, you're allowed to have more dashes, but they don't <laughs> separate things. But no, so yeah. Is, so it's semantic versioning. Yeah. Maven, Maven. Is a completely different take on yeah. it. For example, if you start publishing these artifacts into the Nexus repository, it's going to sort them out alphabetically. Mm -hmm. So what you'll end up with is your, your release uh, coming after your RC, because RC is capital. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you try to pull the latest uh, art artifact, those suffixes will ruin your day. Mm -hmm. So please don't use them ever. Just use the three numbers and be done with it. Yeah. Maybe four, but ju just use numbers. Don't do any suffixes. Otherwise, it's going to break like this or no tomorrow. So we should, or, the, this, or the suffix should really be only used for things that aren't release, release, and it should be uh, and it should be changed if you, uh, you must bump the minor. Um, I mean, you could certainly have, and maybe it would work correctly if you did, you know, 1.0.0.alpha and then release 1.0.1 1 .1 flat, right? Because as long as as long as you assume that like the suffix is attached to your version, but or is the short, or is the short version you don't use them? Yeah, but Maven splits on dots. Everything. It, it, so Maven will take the alpha before the 1.1.1.0.0. .1 .1 .0 .0. Yeah, there are some some keywords have specific meanings in Maven, and it knows how to handle dot alpha and dot so with beta. Prefix, it will be uh, a newer version than without a perfect, the, per, the suffix. Sorry. Yeah, but if you do something like uh, hydrogen and helium, then uh, hydrogen comes after helium. Yeah. So suddenly you you're you're, you're moving back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so need, uh, <coughs> yeah. So which is which is also why you should. You should never have version code names in a version number. Okay, so, so, <laughs> so, so, so the short version is don't use suffixes. Is that well, no, because suffixes are nice because when you're approaching when you're approaching a breaking change, uh, so say you know that um, you've got version one out already and you're going to break API, so you want to switch to version two, but you don't want to inflict major pain on. Well, you don't want to. You don't, uh, you don't want to promise use, stuff. Yeah. Yet, and so you're not ready to so publish a public a public API that you're going to stand behind for version two in its entirety, but you also don't want to start releasing one dot one dot nine dot ninety nine or whatever yeah. because you're going to go and break every, everybody. Yeah, but you still want to say you still want to when you start making breaking changes, you still want to be able to say I'm releasing two dot zero dot zero dash alpha. It's not the real two yet, but it breaks stuff for version one. So if you're on version one, don't switch to yet. How, how will they both uh, work with Maven, though? I mean, again, there is a big problem with using the suffix in Maven. Yeah. Assuming the official release is without any suffixes, right? Yes. And yeah, and, and, uh, and Maven over. Um, well, there are plugins for Maven. Uh, but actually, I was going to. Okay, so, keep going. We can talk about how it's broken for vanilla text. Uh, yeah. So, well, first I was going to say what all this means from downstream and upstream's perspectives. Uh, yes, 11 was the uh, precedence rules. Oh, okay. Oh, we went backwards. Got it. Yeah. So, why is this interesting? Um, the big one. From my point of view, is that for downstream, it mean, downstreams it means that they can start using version ranges, and so instead of uh, so in open daylight, well, during development phases we all just use snapshots, but if we want to switch to release artifacts, um, we don't want to specify specific version numbers. I think because otherwise, whenever anybody makes a change to 
Yang tools or controller, you'd, uh, you'd have to patch everyone. <coughs> but we could say, for, we could say uh, I want to use Yang tools version one, open bracket, comma two, closing parenthesis, and that tells Maven that um, any version one Yang tools artifact is okay, but not version two. And we trust the Yang Tools guys to do their job correctly and not break anything. And remember, they're allowed to fix bugs, so they can. So, so for example, the uh, Yang bug fixes that happened in Beryllium, they wouldn't have required a major version bump because that was a bug. The public, the public API was correct. The implementation wasn't. And when you fix that bug, even though it might break everybody that's using your stuff, you don't have to do a major version bump because your users should have been coding to your spec and complaining about that and not. Just, just to be clear, just because you don't have to bump your minor version doesn't mean you shouldn't tell people? No, that, no, no, no. That, the major, no, the major, the major, the major version. But yeah, yeah you yeah. communicate, you I communicate. Know, this is not meant to accuse people anything, but just, just no, no, no. Yeah, just to establish best practice. Yeah, just to establish best practice. Yeah, in particular. Uh, it, it's just, you know, please, you know, there's two different pieces here. There's our aspirational goals of encoding yes. all of our meetings and, and the reality. Not that people get shipped in parking lots at Open Daylight Summit, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not yet, anyway. But yeah, yeah. So you and you 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 are allowed to do a major version bump, even if it's not strictly necessary. If you want, so it's up to you to decide because that means. You know, then your users will have to change things, uh, at least their version number, to actually use your new artifact. It's less used for things like communicating deprecation in order to do. No, deprecation is just a minor. minor. But then when you remove the deprecated API, that's a major. And um, so the other thing from downstream's perspective is, and that's something that we don't have currently, when, so for, when an upstream project introduces a new feature, then you change your lower bound to that version number so that you're guaranteed that you've got the new feature. And this, this would actually help us with some of the um, dependency cycles that we've ended up with in Open Daylight. So I think, I haven't thought through all the details yet, but for example, when uh, SFC and OVSDB, they define Yang models that they use, each uses the other's um, Yang models. So I'm going to come to Yang revisions because there are other issues there, but if you think of it just as a public API, then you could say SFC adds a public API, so this is a new functionality, and so they release an artifact. OVSDB then depends on that uh, minor version at a minimum, which means that they're guaranteed to have a, to pull in a dependency that supports that. Then they release their stuff that, uh, that's based on what SFC have provided, adding the new stuff that SFC also requires back, because we're in a dependency cycle. Release a new artifact, and SFC bumps its dependency on OVSDB, and that way you've got something that works and that you can actually build all the time without having to do weird things like we do currently, where you disable parts of, I can't remember where it is, but you disable part of SFC to build OVSDB and then rebuild SFC once OVSDB is built. So you build things twice to get what you really want. You don't have to do that. And so really this is about because you can do transactional of black application of like more than one patch. Is that right? Or is it version rate? Mm, no, it's just that uh, you add features in an ordered manner. And then you can declare ordered constraints on how you pull those in. But you can't, you can't bump. Two, the versions of two different projects simultaneously and declare that as a single version bump, it doesn't work. From upstream's perspective, so that's us when we're developing our projects, um, obviously the first step is you have to document your API. So however you've decided what that's going to be, but you have to know what it is and then adhere to it and make sure that if your documentation is external to your code, it's kept up to date. Um, and then once you've convinced your downstreams that you're actually a very sensible developer, uh, you'll never break things without bumping the major version, and they trust you, and they've started switching to ranges, it means you can do release-based development uh, and 
ship bug fixes and your downstreams will benefit from those automatically. So you get, you eliminate the disadvantages of snapshot based development, but without forcing everybody to change their version numbers every time you release something. And so that ideally should encourage people to um, uh, release frequently and release often, but actually release something. So when you've got a bug fix, you ship it, well, test it, ship it, <laughs> and bump the, the minor version. Uh, and what do you suggest uh, during the uh, um, release time frame? I mean, if the release takes uh, four or five months, during that release, uh, every couple of weeks, uh, collect so, all the changes and create. Uh, so, well, there's a, there's 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 a session this afternoon on the uh, fast phased planning proposal. So we'll, uh, we'll discuss stuff like that, I think, in that session. But uh, if you look at the way projects in general are developed in the Java ecosystem, without taking into account Maven's uh, oddities sometimes, but um, whenever, you, there's a, whenever there's a bug fix, you release. Uh, well, if it's important enough, you make a new release and ship that. So you could have multiple releases in, in the span of a week. Right, but the, all the dependent project to change their new but the new snapshot, so. no, because you're not you're not working based on snapshots. You're working based on release artifacts, and you're using version ranges, and so you get the upgrades automatically. But the the so that's sort of in what happens in the general world when you're talking about a bunch of projects that work together, like an open daylight, things change a little bit because if you uh, you need to do. You need to decide what you want to do in terms of testing, and if you add lots of releases and you want to test uh, the way things work, assuming people don't necessarily apply all the upgrades all the time, then your test matrix explodes. So there, there are pros and cons to to doing lots of releases, but uh, yeah. So we we need to discuss that to figure out what the kind of granularity is that you'd expect. Uh, but we're we're not we're not there yet anyway, um, and then it also means that so this also meshes in with the granularity thing. Breaking changes need to be identified before they happen, ideally uh, batched up as well. So the, if you decide that you have a breaking change and you know you're going to bump your major version, then you might as well do other breaking changes while you're at it, so that you don't end up at version 17 in two years' time. Um, but it also means that you should try to figure out what the support cost of that is and decide whether and figure out whether it might not actually be possible to do your change in a non backwards incompatible way you know with support shims or whatever uh, keep the old methods and have them call the new ones and define what the default values are that kind of stuff, because that reduces the cost for your downstreams. And if the cost, so that's another thing, since we're all multiple projects in the same community, there is an aspect to it that uh, if something costs us as an upstream project, but it costs, if doing that means that it costs less globally for all our downstreams, it might be worth doing. A um, couple of tricks and then I'll, I'll move on to the discussion points. So if you make a mistake and break your API without having uh, bumped the major version, some projects just leave it like that and quickly release a version, a new version with the bumped major. And that's wrong because you've just broken all your downstreams and not fixed them. What you need to do first is do a new bug fix release that reverts to the old API so that your downstreams will pick up something that's compatible with what they expect. And then you re-release your changes with the new bumped uh, major version. And also, and this is, this is quite an important one for um, Open Daylight. Obviously, uh, none of our projects exist in a vacuum. They all have upstreams either other open daylight projects or third party dependencies. And when you change your upstream dependencies, 
if it doesn't affect your public API, it shouldn't change your version number. Well, you don't have to um, do a major version bump at least. So that means, for instance, if you switch from Netty 3 to Netty 4, you shouldn't bump your major version. And if, there are, if you have downstreams that were relying on, are relying on you to provide the transitive dependencies to Netty and they break, then that's their fault because it wasn't part of your public API that you were giving access to Netty 4. Unless your ODL parent and parts of controller where we supply artifacts whose job it is to provide upstream dependencies. And so that then the public API is the dependencies that we provide. And so when those change, obviously that doesn't work. But it also it means that um, you know you can change uh, say for instance you Yang tools changes something significant. So there's a or they remove deprecated functionality, so there's a major version bump. That doesn't mean then that all the other downstream projects in open daylight need to bump their major version as they integrate the new Yang tools features, unless the changes made in Yang tools result in backwards incompatible changes to the generated public APIs, which could happen. And so this leads into my discussion. Uh, so right, first, versions in open daylight. Things are made a bit more complicated in open daylight because version we have tons of different version numbers for different things. Uh, we have Maven artifacts. We have and even those are of different natures. So some of them are jars of utility classes. Some of them are carafe bundles or OSGI bundles. Some of them are uh, artifact POMs. So we don't have many of those yet, but it's something that we're likely to start seeing more of in Boron. So is it Maven artifacts, OSGI bundles, carafe features, and Yang revisions? Uh, well, for me, OSGI features and carafe features are supposed to be the same thing. But yeah, so then, yeah, so I forgot as well, there's OSGI bundles and OSGI features, which are, aren't the same thing, and Yang revisions, and Yang revisions aren't semantically versioned. Uh, and we tend not to bump revisions anyway, because there's all this weird thing where, yeah, you add a new feature and it changes your package name, and so you have to rewrite all your code anyway. Uh, so there's a bunch of things that we need to figure out there before we can have a consistent story for all of this. Uh, uh, other things too, um, public, uh, semantic versioning only cares about um, public APIs, but there are instances, I think, in open daylight where it makes sense to care about the ABI. So if you're not familiar with the terminology, API is uh, application public interface and ABI is application binary interface. Oh, application programming interface, sorry, and uh, application binary interface. And so an ABI is the actual uh, bits and bytes of your artifacts. So things like um, the order of uh, data in your data structures, the size of your types when you're sending data over the network, or serializing information. API compatibility can or recompile. ABI yeah, doesn't. Yeah, doesn't. That's, yeah. And so... Because we have things like uh, Yang tools that generate code for us, there might be stuff where we want to bump majors because we're changing the ABI because what's being generated is changed even though you know, your own code might not have changed at all, but you're building with a new version of the Yang plugin and your ABI is changed. And it has an impact on uh, clustering features and also our upgrade story, which is another session later today because um, when you try to, when you, if you want to do seamless upgrades without restarting your container, you have to be able to swap data between all the bits that are running in your container that you're changing as you go along. And so maybe your API hasn't changed, but the data has, uh, the, the format has, and so you really want to um, bump your major version because versus Caraf will help you with multiple major versions together, but it won't help you with uh, minor version bumps. Well, yeah, theoretically it will help you. In their public API, it says that they help you. In practice, version 4 at least of Carafe is supposed to do that. Uh, there's other things like open flow table usage models as well. Uh, you know, because we have various projects that are discussing trying to do things together in open flow tables, perhaps that could become part of our public API in effect. 
So if you change the way you use the open flow tables, you need to do a major version bump because otherwise you're going to have collisions in your switches. Uh, and dot, 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 because there's undoubtedly things I haven't thought about. And that was... Right, yes, so version skew, that's something else that comes up with this. Uh, so it's not, not, not related strictly to, to semantic versioning, but it's when you stop using snapshots. When you stop using snapshots, you start using release artifacts, and so what you really want to do ideally is avoid having tons of different versions at the same time. Uh, so there are some things that you can add tools for, like the Maven Enforcer and so on. So that will help you make sure that you don't have too many different... Uh, yeah, well, it will help you make sure that your bug fixes get applied widely. So that, uh, But um, when it comes to new features and major version bumps, you really need a carrot and stick approach which I think is healthy globally, but it would be a change in habit. So for instance, if uh, the MD cell project decided they need to do a major version bump, then that would mean that all the offset one and two projects need to change to using that. So it's already the case today. They end up with patches that need to be merged and so on. It takes a while. But um, if, you have a, if we're using release artifacts, there's nothing to force you to switch to the new MD cell version the MD cell project would need to convince everybody that it's in everybody's best interest to do so. Which I think is nice because it means that you don't do major version bumps just for the fun of it. You actually add value when you're doing that. The, and, the and only problem that comes in with that is that um, because um, <coughs> when you ship a simultaneous release with a bunch of things in it, yeah. they all damn well better agree. Yeah. So that's yeah. That was the other thing. You need to, you need to converge towards something. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's yes. That's one thing we have in Open Daylight. There's the integration distribution project at the very end that pulls everything together. And so that can also that could also say uh, if you're not if you haven't upgraded to MD Cell two, then you're not part of the release. Um, point four. And this, this uh, relates to what Andrew was asking about version zero. So version zero does exist, but there are no guarantees as far as semantic versioning is concerned. It doesn't apply until version one. So that's nice. It means that when you're starting something, you have no idea really what you're going to, what would make sense as a public API and so on. So you use version zero, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 and so on. As long as you don't start, as long as you don't have version one or greater in the first component of the version, there are no guarantees. Part five is, so as a consequence of that, version 1.0.0 defines your first public API. And it's, if you're starting, off, starting a new project, it's fairly important to wait to get that reasonably right, because it's, once you've started that, it's going to constrain things uh, in the for the future. So, one thing that isn't covered uh, in these points, but I think it's worth pointing out, is that uh, we're not in JVM land here, oh, um, or should I say rather Java JDK land here, so you are allowed to remove things. It's not because you've defined something in a public API that you're stuck with supporting it for the rest of your life. But it is important. It is. For those who don't know me, I'm Stephen Kitt. I work for uh, Red Hat, and I'm active all over Open Daylight, pretty much. <laughs> but mainly in ODL parent and OVSTV. And so we're going to talk about semantic versioning. Um, I'm going to start by saying what it is, rather than why we're talking about it. And then we'll go into the why and how it, if it's useful for Open Daylight and what we should do about it. So it's, the first part is me explaining the semantic versioning spec. And then I'm hoping we can have more of a discussion afterwards. So semantic versioning is uh, a concept. Uh, basically, it means associating uh, meaning with version numbers of software packages, whatever. Uh, and there's a spec on semver.org, and so 
the 11 next slides, they're just a retranscription pretty much of that spec. Um, most people agree that it's, uh, that spec is a sensible definition of semantic versioning, but lots of people then don't necessarily read all 11 points carefully, uh, and it can end up being misused. But that won't happen on open daylight, will it? <laughs> so the, the first point of the semantic versioning spec, and the most important one, is that it only interests itself with public APIs. And it's up to you to define what a public API is. You can say it's anything that's in my developer's guide PDF, or you could say it's anything that's, that has vague Javadoc, or it's anything that's public. And Java terms and not API terms. So that's something that we need to agree upon, I guess. Uh, and then anything that's not in the public API that you've defined is not covered by the semantic versioning spec. So that means that even classes that are public or public methods that are accessible uh, in Java, if they're not part of your public API, all the guarantees that come with semantic versioning don't apply. So there's still a certain amount of freedom. And it means that uh, you do need to document your stuff because your users are going to have to rely on coding using documentation rather than coding using implementation, which I think is nice. But we're not quite there yet in open daylight. The second uh, point is that so semantic versioning defines a canonical version layout, which isn't too surprising compared to what we're used to with version numbers. So there's three components, x, y, and z. X is the major version, Y is the minor version, and Z is the patch version. And then the rest of semantic versioning defines rules about how you change those different components. Uh, all of those three components are always non-negative integers, starting with zero, but they can't have leading zeros. So 0, 01.2.0 is an invalid version number. And but 0. Dot, 0. Dot something is fine. It's nice because it avoids uh, octal surprises. <laughs> um, the third part, third point, and this, this is one that sometimes gets forgotten, is that once an artifact is released with a version number, it never, ever changes. So you get some projects which ignore that, and they'll realize that there's a nasty bug in something that they've just released, and they'll silently update the tarball or move the tag as we were discussing by OpenStack just uh, a few minutes ago. Well, it's not quite the same context there, but if, if you do this, bad things happen. So it, basically, once you've defined what your release artifacts are and you've released something with a given version, we can take a hash of that and it should never, ever change, ever. Important to make at least a reasonable effort to get version 1.0.0 right. Right, so then what are the rules for incrementing all these different uh, components? We'll start with the last one, which is the patch version. And so if you make a new release of a piece of software, or an artifact uh, that has only bug fixes that are all backwards compatible, then you only increment the last uh, part of the version number. So you go from 1.0.0 to 1.0.1. And it says here, a bug fix is an internal change fixing incorrect behavior. And so this is incorrect behavior as defined by the public API. So if you have, if you, if there's a bug in your code that means that it doesn't match the documented behavior, that's a bug and you can fix it with a minor, with a patch increment, even if it breaks stuff because people shouldn't have been coding to your implementation. They should have been coding to your documented public API. So that's, that would be a big change for open daylight as it stands currently, but I think it would be quite good to have. So the next, next step up is uh, when you're adding new features, but uh, in a backwards compatible way, or if you're uh, deprecating existing functionality, 